Mr Davies is a remarkable figure dedicated to serving his community and faith. He has, his extensive experience, leadership and compassion have left an indelible mark within the Salvation Army and the communities he has touched. Please welcome to the stage Marriage Mal Davies. Thank you to Cam for that welcome. Just as I attempt to bring up a uh, PowerPoint that I'll be using, I hasten to mention that Malcolm Blight was one of our finest coaches. <laughs> Yours too, did someone say? <laughs> All right, let's attempt to go there. Oops, that's not it. Do -do -do. Right. Oh, at some stage here I'll find it. It's on? It's on, but it's not my first slide. So now we'll go backwards about there, which will be interesting. Thank you so much for having me. I do appreciate it. I'm, I'm well aware you probably had absolutely no say in it whatsoever, but nevertheless, <laughs> nevertheless, I'm very glad to be here. Thank you for your hospitality. And needless to say, it's a wonderful venue. I feel a little like I'm in church. I don't want to scare you, but we've had a Salvation Army band playing. We've had a choir. There's even an offering plate on the table for you to put your pennies in with me. And now you're stuck with the Salvation Army minister for the next little while. So let me attempt to work through some bits and pieces. Now, this is going to be interesting for me because what's happening on the screen is not what's happening behind me. <laughs> so I'll make it up as we go. It's a time of year when nativity scenes are occurring, when they're being placed in houses and you see them in shopping centres and so on and so on. Some of you may even have put up a little nativity scene at your house, I don't know. They come in all different shapes and sizes these days. Here's a more modern one that some of you might be familiar with. I think my favourite nativity scene that I've seen, for those of you on a budget, is probably this one. Were there, were there three nuts in the stable? Some would argue there were. But um, as I said, for those of you on a budget, that's probably the easiest one to go with. Scenes of the nativity, scenes of the birth of Christ are something that we get very used to and something that many of you, I'm sure, as I said, may have nativity scenes in your house or may have seen images uh, like this one on the screen where we see uh, this baby Jesus uh, born as such in a stable. And for a moment, I guess I wanted to focus on the fact that some of you might have heard it before, that Jesus didn't stay as a baby. And I know you'll be familiar with that. He grew up and became something of, of a natural leader. In 1926, a man called Dr. James Allen Francis, who was a preacher in America, uh, released a little book called The Real Jesus and Other Sermons. And within it, there was one of his sermons where part of the sermon was lifted out into an essay and it was released under the title of One Solitary Life. And I just wanted to read this out for you. It's not that long, as I said, it was just part of a sermon that was lifted out and has been used separately. He said, Here is a man who was born in an obscure village, the child of a peasant woman. He grew up in another village. He worked in a carpenter shop until he was 30. Then for three years, he was an itinerant preacher. He never owned a home. He never wrote a book. He never held an office, he never had a family, he never went to college, he never put his foot inside a big city, he never travelled 200 miles from the place he was born, he never did any of the things that usually accompany greatness. Oops, sorry. While still a young man, the tide of popular opinion turned against him. His friends ran away and one denied him. He was turned over to his enemies and nailed on a cross between thieves. While he was dying, his executioners gambled for his only possession, his coat. When he was dead, he was laid in a borrowed grave. Nineteen centuries have come and gone, and today he is a centrepiece of the human race and of mankind's progress. I am far within the mark when I say that all the armies that ever marched, all the navies that were ever built, all the parliaments that ever sat, and all the kings that ever reigned put together have not affected the life of mankind on this earth as powerfully 
as has that one solitary life. It's amazing, isn't it, when we think about what Jesus didn't do and yet we think about the impact that he's had on our society. Now, this is where it gets a little bit tricky for me because I need to move my screen that you can't see so that I know what I'm doing, just like that. And interestingly, when I click the slide, it goes back to a different one. Hey, Duane, are you good at this? <laughs> hey, Milos, are you good at this? Sorry, folks, but what I've got on my screen is different from what you're seeing, which is really going to confuse me. <laughs> so it's been a pleasure here. Go back to your lunch. Right. So I'm down to that slide. Mm -hmm. But that's certainly not what's coming up on God bless you, Milos. I love you. <laughs> In 2012, uh, John Ortberg, who's an American minister, picked up on a similar theme from The One Solitary Life and he released this book called Who Is This Man? and he explored Jesus and his impact on society and on culture around the world. At one stage, he said this, Regardless of what anyone may personally think or believe about him, Jesus has been the dominant figure in Western culture for nearly 20 centuries. His impact on the world and on humanity is immense. He has inspired art, government, medicine, education and social work, as well as teaching us about mercy, love, forgiveness and compassion. Jesus' impact was greater 100 years after his death than during his life. It was greater still after 500 years. After 1,000 years, his legacy laid the foundation for much of Europe. After 2,000 years, he now has more followers on earth than at any other time in history. Who is this man? I was chatting at the table a moment ago and I made a, a very similar point at the moment. There are more Christians on the earth than there ever has been in the history of the world. The Christian church continues to grow 2,000 years after Jesus walked the earth. Back in the 1950s and 60s especially, there's a whole series of movies made about Jesus and about other biblical stories. This is one picture from uh, the movie, The Greatest Story Ever Told. It was a wonderful movie, won many Academy Awards, but its portrayal of Jesus was very interesting because it portrayed a Jesus who somehow managed to walk through first century Palestine without getting a speck of dust on him. And it's almost like he flinted, floated about an inch above the ground. There was this very perfect, angelic sort of Jesus uh, that was portrayed there. In recent movies, we've seen a more uh, humane or more earthly, if you want, Jesus. And in some ways, I'd argue it's almost this Jesus that the Salvation Army has taken more as a model, a Jesus who lived in the world, who lived amongst people, who dealt with the daily issues that people deal with. And more so, he went above and beyond when it came to service and when it came to his relationship with others. Jesus was accused of spending time with those who were classed as sinners. He touched lepers and spoke to beggars, the disabled and the outcast. He spent time with tax collectors, Romans and Samaritans who were all despised by the Jews. He defended a woman caught in adultery and showed respect for another thought to be a prostitute. He respected and welcomed children who were second-class citizens in that culture. He met with religious leaders and a rich young ruler, yet his best friends were fishermen and commoners. Jesus spent a life, a life, mingling with those that he was told by his culture not to mingle with. These are the people that looked out, he looked out for. There's also just one Bible passage I wanted to read to you today, and for those who are a bit 
scared about that. I'm sure you lightning won't come through the roof if you listen to a passage from the Bible. It might get you out in the way in the car in the car park, but it won't, it won't come through the hallowed roof here at Adelaide Oval. It's from Matthew 25, and it said this, The king will say to those on his right, Come you who are blessed by my father, take your inheritance, the kingdom prepared for you since the creation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty, and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger, and you invited me in. I needed clothes, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you looked after me. I was in prison, and you came to visit me. And the righteous will answer him, Lord, when did we see you hungry or feed you or thirsty and give you something to drink? When did we see you a stranger and invite you in or needing clothes and clothe you? When did we see you sick or in prison and go to visit you? The king will reply, truly I tell you, whatever you did for one of the least of these brothers and sisters of mine, you did for me. This is a passage in the Bible, a couple of verses that absolutely inspire the Salvation Army in what we do, that when we see people, we see Christ and therefore we treat them with the appropriate value and respect, politeness, as if we were working with Christ. This sort of image that you're looking at is an image that's very common to me and others around here and I'm sure many of you would uh, be familiar with this sort of image and it's easy to look at a picture on a screen but it's a bit more challenging when it comes uh, real. It was mentioned earlier that for three years in fact I was based in London and involved in the work of the Salvation Army over there. At one stage I was crossing London Bridge, I was walking across the Thames and I could see halfway across the bridge there was a homeless man sitting at the side on the footpath there. I wasn't in Salvation Army uniform, it was just a day where I was just in normal clothing as such. And I could see his signs out and I knew that he was going to ask me for money. And as with many of you, um, I wasn't carrying any cash. I had plastic, but I simply didn't have any cash on me and I knew I wouldn't be able to give him anything. I approached the man and sure enough, as I came near him, he asked if I could spare uh, not some dollars but some pounds. He asked if I could spare any pound or pence for a homeless man. And I said to him, look, I just can't, I'm sorry, I've only got credit cards, I don't have any cash on me at all. And I kept walking. And I'd taken a few steps and then he called out to me and he said, no problem, Governor, thanks for talking to me. And that took a little while to sink in. I couldn't give him anything, but he thanked me simply because I spoke to him. I didn't just ignore him, I didn't walk past and say nothing as people it seems had been doing most of the day. He thanked me just for talking to him. Some years ago I was involved in editorial and literary work for the Salvation Army. I was the editor-in-chief for Australia and also later in the United Kingdom. So I was involved in the publishing of books and also of magazines. One of the books that I edited was this tribute to General Eva Burroughs called The People's General. Um, it was a lovely book and I had many opportunities to sit down with uh, General Burroughs and talk through uh, a collection of over 200 photos that were published in this book. Um, I want to show you my favourite photo in the book. And in the book, can I say, there were photos of her meeting uh, presidents and prime ministers, uh, Mother Teresa, Billy Graham, uh, various popes and so on. Um, a whole lot of important people. But my favourite photo in the book is just a little black and white photo and it's that one there. This is a homeless man uh, who's built out of cardboard boxes a little home on a wooden bench in a park in London. Uh, he's built it on the bench so that he's not on the ground, of course, to try and evade, uh, avoid rather the cold uh, from the ground. And this is General Eva Burroughs leader of an international church operating in 135 countries, speaking 211 languages. She is kneeling in the snow to talk to this homeless man. It's a stunning photo. It's a stunning photo of a leader of an international movement kneeling on the ground in the snow so that she can go eye to eye with a homeless man, talk to him at his level. It's my favourite photo in the book and immediately when I saw it the very first time my mind went to another image and that's an image of Jesus washing his own disciples' feet at the Last Supper. It was most appropriate for one of them to wash his feet, being the master. 
but here he was washing his own disciples' feet. In Mark 10, 43 to 45, it says, Whoever wants to be great among you must be your servant, and whoever wants to be greatest of all must be the slave of all. And then Jesus said, For I'm not here to be served, but to serve others. I'm not here to be served, but to serve others. The International uh, Mission Statement of the Salvation Army says this, The Salvation Army, an international movement, is an evangelical part of the universal Christian church. Its message is based on the Bible. Its ministry is motivated by the love of God. Its mission is to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ and to meet human needs in his name without discrimination. On the international website for Rotary, it says, we provide service to others, promote integrity and advance world understanding, goodwill and peace through our fellowship of business, professional and community leaders. Together, we see a world where people unite and take action to create lasting change across the globe, in our communities and in ourselves. Do you see some of the phrases that are being used there by both of us? We meet human needs, we provide service to others, people unite and take action. Friends, there's common ground, isn't there? There's common ground between Rotary and the Salvation Army and what we do. I think a large part of what we do is that we take mess. We take things that look not quite right. We take things that are not as they're supposed to be and we help them reach their potential. We help them become what they are supposed to be. We work with people who are not always in a good state and we try and make their lives better. That's what we do. And friends, that's what Jesus taught us to do. As I said, 2,000 years ago, 2,000 years ago, it wasn't a baby, but it was this man who walked the earth and somehow what he did has echoed across the world through 20 centuries and continues to impact lives in Adelaide today. A moment ago, I was saying at the table that last week we had a lady come into our offices. She needed assistance, which is common for us every day. We have folks come in who need assistance in one way or another. She was a middle-aged lady. Um, she was from, a, can I say, a fairly comfortable background. Um, she was crying. It was the first time she'd ever had to ask someone for help. And there's the real impact of the cost of living crisis. This was the first time she never thought she would have to come to the Salvation Army and ask for assistance. But quite simply, if she wanted to put food on the table for her children, then she needed to uh, stoop a little and come into the Salvation Army offices and say, I can't do it alone, can you help me? These are the sorts of people we see day by day, and can I say, they're the sorts of people that Rotary assist all around the world, day by day. So in conclusion, um, I want to thank you. I want to thank you for what you do. I want to thank you for the partnership that you have with Salvation Army. I want to thank you for the impact that you have on people living in Adelaide. It would be easy to stand here and give you a, a theological uh, lecture. Um, I'm happy to spend a time chatting with you about the, the prologue to John's Gospel and the infrastructure of the etymology of the words there and to discuss... Uh, the various implications of what he said, but just quietly, that's not going to help anyone. What we need to do is be pragmatic, we need to be practical, we need to do the work that we're doing. For the Salvation Army, as we say to ourselves, we need to be the hands and feet of Jesus. And we're so grateful that we have organisations like Rotary to work in partnership with us. Friends, I hope you have a wonderful Christmas and a Happy New Year. God bless you. <laughs>